Hey again, everyone. Um, I think it's a good time to begin. Uh, we have a, a few participants, um, and I expect more people will be uh, joining shortly or even listening to the recording uh, when it uh, is uploaded onto the website at a later date. Um, cool. So, welcome to the to this webinar, which is a, a deep dive into the ILA benchmarking assessment tool for uh, assessing um, lead battery recyclers, but also of relevance to other e-waste um, recycling um, uh, types and organizations. And um, yeah, so th the aim of this call is to present the, um, the tool, which has been developed by the International Lead Association and used widely, I understand. And, uh, we're really pleased to have Brian Wilson on the on the line to present this. He's a senior independent consultant at ILA, and our uh, engagement with Brian uh, sprung out uh, of the Google e-waste uh, toolkit and the the first module, uh, which was looking at the technical introduction to recycling of off-grid solar products. And of course, uh, one of the main uh, components to be thinking about is batteries. Um, and um, yeah, we had Brian join us for the, the seminar for that module, um, who was a, a fantastic uh, panelist and introduced this uh, this tool. And we um, we recognised it was um, important and uh, had a potentially a lot of value to to Google members. So we've uh, organised this webinar as a bolt on to module one. Uh, of the toolkit to do a to do a deep dive into uh, into this tool, um, and the aim is that this will form part of the the e-waste toolkit and sit on the the e-waste hub on the the Google website and be a resource that's available to Google members and um, the the general public um, beyond the call today. Um, so. Um, yeah, the the large part will be um, of the uh, the webinar will be Brian presenting his tool, followed by uh, an opportunity to ask um, questions, and then a quick uh, wrap up at the end with next steps around the toolkit. So, quick um, quick point on housekeeping. Uh, after the call, we will share the slides, and they will be. Um, I believe uploaded onto the hub. Need to share with Brian that that's um, that's okay. Yeah, uh, Juliana tells me it's okay. That's good. Thank you. Um, this uh, this is being recorded and will be uploaded to to the hub as well. And if anybody has any questions, um, as you see, there's a you know a good amount of time after Brian's presentation um, for that. Um, and we can you can do it. Uh, Either by raising a hand and um, then and speaking up, or there is a chat box as well where you can uh, put questions. Um, I believe that's it by way of introduction. Um, I think um, only left for me is to um, introduce uh, uh, Brian um, and uh, pass over over to him. It's um, so you know Brian's uh, you know clearly a, a guy who's got you know bags and bags of experience looking at um, 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 lead battery recyclers in particular and is uh, I understand being instrumental in developing this tool and applying it in many cases um, and we're, we're really uh, grateful to be Brian to, to make um, time um, for, for this webinar and um, making this resource available to, to Google and its members um, going forward so yeah with no further ado I'd like to, to yeah. pass over to you to, to take it away. Just make you presenter as we go. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, Drew. I'm just clicking on to show my screen. I trust, Drew, you can see the screen. Yes, yes, we can. Yes, and uh, thank you for Juliana. She uh, prepared this slide to open the presentation so that uh, everybody can see uh, where they need to log their question and actually it would be easier for me if the questions are actually prepared uh, in writing and then sent uh, via the chat box. Uh, can I just say also Drew that uh, I understood from Athena 
that uh, one of the other reasons that you wanted to uh, to record and to present this uh, use of the benchmarking assessment tool was that you might be able to use a similar process for your e-waste. Although this is specifically designed for users as your batteries, uh, you can mm -hmm. use the process uh, if you if you change the parameters for environmentally sound management, health and safety. Uh, you can use it for e-waste, and it was this this was one of the reasons why um, I was asked to present this uh, this today. Yeah, I, absolutely, that's correct. Um, so um, yeah, we kind of understand that this has been developed specifically for lead battery recycling, but. Um, yeah, of course, a lot of um, the, the products are using uh, lithium batteries and I've got, um, you know, the kind of um, fractions of e-waste and, um, yeah, the, the idea that is that we can kind of adapt or our members can adapt this for, for their purpose when um, assessing other types of e-waste recyclers. That's, so, yeah, that's, exactly. that's, that's it, exactly. That's it, exactly. So yeah. you actually prepare a benchmarking assessment tool for e-waste? Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, so it'd be good to yeah, hear from you as you're presenting, you know, um, you know what's, um, what your suggestions are for that adaptation. We have some music. Now, normally, before anyone uses the benchmarking assessment tool, they undergo an extensive training session that identifies and assesses the means to achieve environmentally sound management and good health and environmental uh, practices. However, for today's exercise, I'm going to skip that session so that you can just see how the process worked. Now, this, was a, this process was originally designed in conjunction with the Basel Secretariat regional center in Beijing, and it was designed specifically for regulators to use because they, they felt uncomfortable going into plants, um, recycling plants, and not understanding exactly what they were looking at. But what we found over the years is that this tool can also be used for self-assessment and for third parties to identify a good environmentally sound practices. So before I start, let's just look at the main areas of activity. We've got collection, transportation, temporary storage, braking, electrolyte management, recycling, and then any byproducts. And we have closed loop processes, plastic containers in use, everything's under cover. We have saws and hammer mills to break the batteries. We have neutralization of the electrolyte, ventilated smelting and inert products. So the batteries are undrained, they're in leak proof containers, there's no leakage, there's no manual breaking of the batteries, no discharge from the uh, sites, and emissions are under control. Now, when you're making observations, uh, does the regulator or yourselves just observe and measure? Wouldn't it be nice if you could make those observations and perhaps make some judgments? So the questions for regulators that we ask is, can you evaluate performance? Can you identify problems? And can you then make recommendations to improve the environmentally sound management of used acid batteries, along with health and safety improvements? And this would be the ideal situation, and this can apply to government regulators and for self-regulation. So what if the regulator or yourselves could identify the problems and then help to resolve them? So we've development, developed this benchmarking assessment tool and we've tried to make it comprehensive and easy to use. The only tools that we need to carry out these assessments are some pH papers to test whether there's any acid contamination and an anemometer, which measures the wind speed. And we use this to assess the, the ventilation and extraction systems, whether they're working effectively or not. The scheme is entirely consistent with the Basel technical guidelines. And this is the benchmark that we use uh, in this process. The benchmarking assessment tool comes in the form of a questionnaire. And I'll just give you an example of a page now. Now, I don't expect you to read that in two minutes, but essentially we have nine or 10 questions 
on the left hand side of the form. And then the answers to those questions in columns A, B, C and D going from on the, on the for the most part from the worst practices to the best practices from A to D. So you answer a question, you ask a question and then you decide which category A, B, C or D the answer might fall into. And the form can identify good practices and those that are perhaps not so good. Now, the ones that are not so good are normally on the left or on the right, sorry, in column D, and they're identified here as in green. Now, you'll notice that in some of the, um, of the, uh, the questions, there's answers from A, B, C and D all in green. But these are only for information purposes. For example, one and two, what batteries are being collected and how are they collected? This is purely for information. And how are they sorted? It doesn't really matter whether they're by size, in plastic cases, automotive or industrial, as long as they're sorted, uh, all those are perfectly acceptable. And you'll notice in question six, for example, there's an answer in A, which is which is green. And that is if a battery arrives at a, uh, um, at a scrap dealer and they test it and they find that the battery is quite good, but just needs to be recharged, then they can recharge it and then send it back to the customer or to deliver it back to the customer without it need without the need, the need to recycle it. And that's actually very good practice as well. And it's applicable to the whole life cycle. So you can see that it covers collection, storage, transportation and recycling. Now, one of the big differences between the benchmarking assessment tool and a regulatory inspection is the following. The regulatory inspection tends to be specific and on the whole, regulators focus on the recycling plant, whereas the benchmarking tool is holistic. It, it focuses not on one particular aspect, but on the whole supply chain from the collection of the batteries to the storage, the temporary, uh, the temporary storage, the transportation and the recycling. And this in the terms of used acid batteries is very important because a lot of damage is done to the environment at the collection stage when acid is invariably dumped from the batteries into the environment. The regulatory inspection does not pick this up normally. And they tend to focus on a single location, uh, the recycling plant, whereas the benchmarking tool looks at the whole supply chain. And in the supply chain, you may have many different uh, dealers supplying used acid batteries to the recycling plant, and it will evaluate the performance of all those, of all those involved. The regulatory inspection is quantitative. And as I've said before, there's no substitute uh, for for not carrying out quantitative assessment. It's important to know what levels of lead are discharged from the site, what levels of lead are in the emissions. But the benchmarking at all is qualitative. It does not measure any of those discharges. It makes observations. So it looks at whether there is fume or dust coming out of the stack, whether there is effluent being discharged from the site rather than actually measuring. Because it's not taking quantitative measurements, it's only taking qualitative assessments, then there's nothing that can be used against the company by a regulator in terms of fines or prohibition notices. It's focused on identifying problems and then resolving them. So it brings the lead industry and the ministry environment together to try and resolve issues that might be causing concern. The regulatory inspection is reactive in as much as the regulators, they come onto the site, they take some samples uh, from the stacks or from the effluent discharge. They then take them away to the laboratory, they analyze them. And then a week or so later, they return the results to the plant. And if they're out of uh, spec, then a week has gone by when acid has been discharged into the river or lead dust is being um, in, contained in the emissions. The benchmarking tool is proactive. So if you can see smoke coming out of the stack or you can see the acid is being discharged from the site, you don't have to wait a week to resolve the problem. You can resolve it there and then immediately. So these are some of the questions that you should ask yourselves when you're carrying out a benchmarking assessment inspection. Is this practice acceptable? How would you monitor the situation if it's unacceptable? And is the task or operation necessary? For example, if you see somebody breaking batteries with a machete, is that really the right way to break a battery? 
And if it isn't, what recommendations could you make to improve performance, reduce safety risks and occupational exposure? Now, the phases for used acid battery recycling, and this may not be the same with e-waste, but certainly for recycling of batteries, we've got collection, temporary storage, packaging, transportation and recycling. So the first step in the use of the benchmarking tool is to make an inspection and complete the assessment form. And let's return to the assessment form. Uh, the first one is dedicated to collection and supply points. And we've got questions, as I said, on the, on the left and answers on the right. So let's just take an example. Let's start, try and identify some key benchmarks. And we'll just choose one at random. Number three, how are the user acid batteries delivered? Drained of acid, which is unacceptable, or complete with acid? And let's look at the options that we've got. And then we can determine compliance with the benchmarks. So we've got drained, which is the worst case, some drained, a few drained, or if it's ideal and it's environmentally sound, the batteries would arrive on site complete with acid. Now, let's take another example. Number eight, how are the used acid batteries collected and transported to the recycling plant? They could be on a bicycle and a cart. Certainly that happens. It could be in an open truck. It could be in a truck or a van, or it could be in a licensed vehicle. And that would be entirely environmentally sound and safe. Now, if we were to ask all the questions on the left hand side and we get all answers on the right hand side and they all are environmentally sound because we've circled all the green boxes with the answers, then there's a very good indication that our collection and supply system is environmentally sound, safe and hygienic. So what you need to do then is to repeat the process for each section of the form. And I'm obviously not going to go through every single question today. So we'll just take one example here. Let's take number three. Is the process effluent discharged from the site? And we've got answers always discharged and untreated. That's most unsatisfactory, of course, sometimes untreated after treatment and never discharged because we operate a closed loop system. And that would be the ideal situation. So if we ask all the questions again and we get answers that we can fill boxes in on the right hand side of the form and they're all in the green boxes, then we know we've got a very good indication of good environmental practice. If we have a look at occupational lead exposure, extremely important for workers. Let's just take an example. Lead is toxic, so uh, it's important that uh, eating and process areas are segregated. Well, let's find out what the options are. So no, eating on site is not permitted. And yes, but not ventilated or yes, with HEPA filters, high efficiency particulate filters and air conditioning. Now, for example, you might think that eating on site not permitted is actually good practice. But actually, bearing in mind that lead is toxic, it's a very good idea to eat when you're on site or at least be uh, be satisfied when you're on site because otherwise if you have an empty stomach on site it's very easy to ingest lead so if we go through all the questions for occupational lead exposure and we again have all the boxes filled in on the green zone then that's a very good indication that our occupational lead exposure practices are very good the last the last one that we look at is safety can't have an environmentally sound plant operating in an unsafe manner so we have nine questions on key issues on safety. Let's look at one of them. Number seven, for maintenance purposes, is there a permit to work and a lock off system for maintenance? And the options are no, that's very unsafe. There's a permit to work only. There's a lock off system only. Or yes, there's a permit to work and a lock off system with locks and keys. And that is entirely safe. So we can go through safety questions, answering all the questions that are on the left. If all the answers are in column D and C as a top one, and they're all in the green boxes, then we know this is 
a very good indication of a safe operation. But as we well know, life isn't like that. However, we can identify the non-compliance issues and we can prepare recommendations to improve. And now I'm going to go through examples where we can use the last two headings here, identify non-compliance and then making recommendations for improvement. So if we go back to our collection and supply point, how are the used acid batteries delivered, drained of acid or complete with acid? And we have a look at the examples again. And let's say, for example, on this particular operation, some are drained. Ideally, we would want them to be complete, but only some are drained. How are the used acid batteries collected and transported to the recycling plant? In an open truck. Not ideal, but that's the reality. What we would like to do is to move them towards having a licensed truck or vehicle. If we have a look at the environmental status, is the process effluent discharged from the site? Well, let's just say it's always discharged from the site and totally untreated. Ideally, what we would like them to do is to move to never, but let's just say that's quite expensive move to go to an effluent treatment plant. So at least let's move initially to neutralization of the acid and then discharge from the site, perhaps putting it through a filter plant to remove any solid material in the effluent but at least that would be a first step. And then perhaps later, later, we can then move to a state where they're never discharged from the site. And that would be ideal. Looking at occupational lead exposure, are the eating and process areas segregated? Um, yes, they are segregated. It's important to do so, but in this case, they're not ventilated. What we really want them to do is to move to HEPA filter and full air conditioning. And is there a permit to work and lock off system for maintenance? Well, let's just say, for example, that there's a permit to work system only and there isn't lock off. There's no compromise on safety here. It has to be lock off with a permit to work system with locks and keys. So that's where we would like them to be. Having carried out the assessments and made those observations, then it's very easy for us to actually put together the recommendations to improve health, safety and environmental performance. We have three categories, short term at minimum or no cost, medium term, or uh, which is low cost, and long term where there is some capital investment involved. And in the short term category, we know that we should only be identi we should only be purchasing used batteries that are complete with electrolyte and making sure they're delivered to the site complete with electrolyte. And we should license the vehicle uh, so that it can collect hazardous waste. In the short and medium term, we should neutralize and filter the electrolyte prior to discharge. There is a cost in neutralizing the acid, but it's not a huge cost. We should install a positive pressure HEPA filter system for a canteen. Again, that's not a very expensive thing to do. And we should introduce a lock-off system for isolation of plant during maintenance. And again, this is this is low cost, but very safe. And in the long term, in terms of the uh, closed loop system for effluent, then we would need to invest in an effluent treatment plant. And this will take some capital investment so that we can then operate a fully closed loop system and not discharge any effluent to the environment. So where has this been applied? Well, here we can see it being applied in Costa Rica. And the gentleman on the left of the picture in the blue shirt uh, was the director of the Basel Convention Regional Center for Central America and Mexico. And he's at a plant in Costa Rica. Then here we are. This is a training workshop for government regulators and inspectors in Indonesia. And here we are working with one of the local smelters in, in Jakarta. Here it's being uh, applied in Kenya. Um, at the invitation of ABM batteries and also the government of Kenya. And we're training uh, staff on site and, uh, and regulators. Here in Ghana, at the invitation of the Ghanaian government, we train 23 regulators to actually use and apply the benchmarking assessment tool. And this, was take, this picture was taken a couple of weeks ago in Ghana at the UNIA conference, uh, sorry, in Kenya at the UNIA conference, and the director of the Cleaner Production Centre in Ghana was explaining to the delegates that since 
the BAT course last year in Ghana, the BAT system has been applied as part of the licensing procedure so that plants are inspected before licenses are issued to recycling plants. Then we have a workshop here in Colombia, uh, in Cali, where we were training government regulators in the use of the BAT in conjunction with the local recycling plant. And where it all began in China, this was our first BAT training course uh, in, in, in China. And uh, a few weeks ago, I was in India, in Bihar province, uh, where we were training government regulators to use the BAT course in conjunction with the local smelters so they could carry out a real-time inspection after their training. And um, I was also running a training course in Fiji for Pacific Batteries. They are using it to improve their own performance of their battery recycling and battery manufacturing operation. So what conclusions can we draw from the use of the BAT? Well, in the opinion of the users, it's easy to use, very fast and proactive. So they can make changes the same day that they carry out the assessment. It does identify health, safety and environmental issues and problems. It, the process is qualitative and based on observation. So it's very simple to learn and apply. It's non-confrontational and it drives forward the environmentally sound management process. And it can be a very useful indicator of environmentally sound management. And certainly for regulators, um, it saves them a lot of time and money. They don't have to go to the expense of carrying out extensive quantitative um, measurements um, and then find that they're out of compliance. Far better to find they're out of compliance using the assessment tool, put them into compliance and then take the measurements. Then you only have to do it once. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I just want to remind you that the BAT is the property of the ILA and can only be used under license. I just have to say that the licenses are issued to those that are trained to use the scheme and the licenses are free of charge and they're valid for a lifetime. Thank you very much, everybody. Cool. Thank you very much, Brian. That was uh, really interesting. A good, um, good deep dive into the, the BAT. Is there um, a question that immediately jumps to my mind after that is um, the, the, uh, the licensing and um, can, can you say a bit more about that if a um, Googler member wanted to access that licensing and use the tool what would how would that work in practice uh, that would be very easy all we would need to do is to run the training course uh, for the use of the tool because uh, although the tool is based on observation you need to know what you're looking at so the yeah. first part of the day would be understanding uh, with examples of what good practice is uh, and what is not good practice so that you can differentiate between the two. And, and when you understand that, then you can use the BAT scheme. At the end of the BAT training course, um, we will give you a certificate, which is a lifetime license. It's free of charge. Uh, there's no charge whatsoever for it to use it because we want people to use it, um, but we don't want people to use it without being trained. Otherwise, their assessments and their judgments may not conform to the standards that we've set out or are set out in the Basel Convention Technical Guidelines. Okay. Uh, Athena, by the way, has been through the training course, um, so she's very familiar with the way it works. Yeah, okay. understood. And the, the training courses, you run them on demand? Um, or, or... We do it in two ways. Uh, we, do, we, do have regular require, we do have regular requests to run training courses. And what I try to do, I try really hard to do this, um, is to run a training course when we're at a smelting site so that when people have been trained to use the assessment tool, they can actually go into a real plant and carry out a real assessment. That's why when you saw some of the pictures um, on the use of the BAT, you can see that some of the training was held at recycling plants. If we can't do that, then uh, I do have two or three videos uh, which give you a virtual uh, walk through a plant so that you can carry out the observations in a classroom. And I've done this for the uh, for UNEP in Geneva and I would do this for you guys as well. But, you know, if you're going to do that, then you would need to get together 12 to 20 participants so as to make it really worthwhile. Yeah, OK. Um... We have a we have a question that's come through. Um, can you see that, Brian? Uh, I can't see it at the moment because I've got the screen up. But I'm going to try and get the screen up now. 
for some reason I have lost the screen. Uh, I'm just trying to find it. Sometimes I can, I can I can I can hear you, but I can't see you, and I can't I can't get my screen back up. Oh, there it is. <laughs> so you have to talk to me. Uh, my screen is missing for mm. some reason. Right, I can now I can now see the questions. Where is the question? Uh, do you have the um, the? Oh, I've, got, I've got the chat box open, but I can't see a question. It's uh, it's there's a separate question section above the chat. Okay, the only thing I've got above the chat is the um, is the attendees at the moment. Let me just see. I can I can read you a question. Okay, now. if you can read the question, then I'll try and. Um, so it's from uh, Grayson Martini at um, uh, let me see at Mobisol in Tanzania, and his question is: the tool is currently paper-based. Are there plans to automate the scores according to the answers slash options select selected in the tool to avoid subjectivity in scoring? Um, a subjectivity in scoring is is an issue, and this is this is why it's an assessment tool. It's not uh, it's not quantitative, but that's why the essential the training is also essential. Now, with Mobizol, we have run training courses that Mobizol have attended in Kenya and Tanzania, uh, and and some of their staff are trained to actually use the tool. Um, but that that's why the training is so important, um, so that we don't have different different answers to uh, with different um, different assessors but when we we're, we're not going to computerize it because uh, the technologies are always changing so the tool will always be changing as well so there's 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 no there's no reason i don't think uh, to to computerize it so we get scores i think that it's, it's good enough to do the training and use the boxes that we've got to actually place the um, the the operation in a particular box Okay, understood. Um, and you mentioned that Mobisol have done the done the training, and uh, I know that they've um, also done some assessments of lead battery recycling in Tanzania. Um, yes, uh, they they did actually recently. Uh, the, one of the Mobisol staff that we trained carried out um, his own assessment, uh, and I'm more than confident he did a good job in Tanzania. He visited two two recycling plants that they wanted to process their batteries for solar for solar energy through. And he carried out some assessments and also he was able to prepare uh, recommendations for improvement um, so that the plant would be of a standard that they were satisfied that they could actually send their batteries to without uh, feeling that they weren't being recycled in an environmentally sound manner. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. And, yeah, and, 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 I, and I'm more than happy for that. I mean, I'm only one person. I, the more people that are trained to use the tool and can apply it, uh, the better battery recycling will be around the world. Yeah, yeah. We have Peter on the line from from Mobisol, who I understand was involved in that exercise. Peter, yes, he you... was. Hi, Peter. Hi, Peter. Can you uh, let me let me unmute you and um, be interested yeah. if you could share your experience of using the tool and working with the uh, with the recycler on it. I'm particularly interested to hear how receptive they they were are to the kind of the recommendations and how it kind of helped your relationship yeah of course thanks uh thanks as a prime for the introduction and i also want to comment that like it's been very helpful to use this benchmarking tool i believe you also have rafael on the line he's the one who was trained actually and Grayson who was asking the question was accompanying me and rafael to these recycling plants recycling plants which we had visited like around like, two months ago and yeah, it's been uh, it's been very good to visit these recycling plants using the benchmarking tool, and it was very easier to go through the questions because, as you said, it's very objective, and and it was good to have Rafael with us who was particularly trained on that. And regarding how the recyclers were receiving us, like I think they were very open to improve their own operations and they were very open to the recommendations we gave as we also highlighted as you highlighted earlier in the presentation uh what are the low-hanging fruits what are very easy things to implement we had for example some improvement suggestions on 
visual man visual management like that warning sign should be placed here and there or like some standard operation procedures should be better displayed um and yeah so it's been it's been a good journey with these recyclers currently we're waiting for their actual improvements so that they're kind of proving to us that the recommendations are turned into actions um starting with the low hanging low cost to the more than more costly uh, improvements okay so you you use the tool as part of your due diligence with this recycler and you can exactly. say well, you're you know you acting upon these recommendations is um, is, is necessary for us to provide a you know a service contract with you is that how you play exactly it? That, that was our communication to this recycler thing if they comply to these recommendations or like if they improve the operations in certain points then we are happy and willing to cooperate with them and send our batteries to their recycling plants but only with these limitations i think one thing i wanted to add is we had one challenge uh, with comparing the actual two recycling plants. Um, since we visited two, and now we're in the middle of deciding which one to choose, I think a sort of scoring and rating would be helpful to know, okay, which of the plants is in the end the better one? Uh, because one is maybe performing better on the safety side, the other is maybe performing better on some other regulation or like on the transport side. And it's been a bit of a struggle then to identify which is scoring in the end the highest. Mm -hmm. Brian, do you have any suggestions for that point? Uh, that's not easy. I'm, I'm actually delighted that um, that they have got to make a choice uh, because this means yeah. that you're more likely to get the plants uh, both improving, uh, both the plants improving their um, their operations in order to get the contract to recycle the batteries. My advice to Peter is that whilst whilst you've got two uh, that are perhaps close in terms of evaluation and perhaps are better in some areas and, and other areas, my advice always is do not put your eggs in one basket um, and and try to make sure that both the companies are on the ball and improving. Uh, so you might want to send some batteries to one and some batteries to the other company. So they, they feel that they've both got an incentive to make improvements. All right, thanks for that. Otherwise, we also have Raphael and the equation on the call in case you want to ask them some questions there. have been with me uh, during these visits. I think Ra Raphael's fallen off. He, he was here earlier, um, but it's not there. And uh, Grayson. Seems to have lost. It's here, but it's connection. been showed as <laughs> offline. I don't know if that's a connection issue or what exactly. Um, um, Brian, maybe I, I can ask another question in the meantime. Um, the the assessments that ILA and others have done, um, are, are they ever made publicly available, or is that just strictly between um, between you and the, the recyclers? And and I ask that, I'm, you know, I'm thinking if say, a, you know. Um, one of our members is interested to look at um, ABM in Kenya, for example, and rather than you know every single company going through this this same exercise, you know it would be uh, efficient if there was you know some some kind of sharing or open access to to the assessments. Yes, uh, there there is, but uh, in the case of and and it was a very good example ABM uh, in in Kenya because Mobizol did engage uh, me to help them carry out an assessment there. And uh, the assessment report that I prepared based on the benchmarking assessment tool uh, was shared with Mobizol completely and also with ABM. And the other thing is that what I try and do is I try and go back and have a look at uh, the plant, say, a year or two later. And I had the opportunity to go back and visit ABM batteries only a month ago when I was in Kenya attending the UNIA conference. I went there a couple of days early and I went to the ABM plant to see how far down the line they were with the improvements that they promised to make to Mobizol uh, a couple of years ago. And they have a five year plan and they have made terrific progress uh, in moving forward. And I wrote a brief report uh, uh, just to update everybody, which I did send to Peter and to Raphael so that they were up to speed uh, with what was going on at ABM. I, I hope you did receive that, Peter. Yes, we did receive it. 
And I think Mobis is also very much willing to talk to other Google members so in, since we have done our research in Kenya and in Tanzania. So we definitely can exchange experience here because we are very much interested in environmental sound management of lead as a battery. So we're very much open to share the experience there. Yes, but the main reason that we don't publish um, the results online is that it's very rare uh, that we find a plant that's completely environmentally sound. And we're not out to embarrass them by publishing their deficiencies on the Internet. Um, so they, they are kept private to either the customer, which would be um, uh, ABM batteries in the case of Kenya, and the client, which was Mobizol. Um, so, so that that's that's what is. Remember, that the the tool is designed to be non-confrontational. It's designed to push the process forward. We're not the police. We're not looking to find companies or get them into trouble. We only want them to improve. Uh, and as Peter said, a lot of the improvements can be made at almost no or negligible cost. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's uh, I think a, a good point. And um, so I think a uh, more informal sharing amongst uh, Google members through such as the waste working group is a is a better way to yeah, sh share that information rather than expecting any kind of you know publishing or um, yeah or publicly or making this stuff publicly available. Um, I, I have another question now on um, we talked earlier about um, this being a tool for uh, assessing e-waste recyclers as well as lead acid battery recyclers. Can you say a few words on how you would um, expect that that, that uh, adaptation to be? You know, that what what percentage do all of these categories and um, these these four categories of um, questions work out? And how many how many yes. questions you think are relevant? And how, how much uh, how many new yes. questions would you be required? Let let me say there are two versions of the benchmarking assessment tool. Um, this one that we went through today, which was just looking at the process, uh, is for used lead acid batteries. There is a benchmarking assessment tool also for lead acid battery manufacturing. Uh, which is much more comprehensive than the one we looked at today. It's got many more categories. Um, they're both specific to battery recycling and lead acid battery manufacturing. There are different standards uh, in each because they're different operations. And what you'll need to do with Athena and others is you'll need to work out where your benchmarks are, uh, what the standards are for electronic waste recycling, you know, th so that PVC is stripped and recycled, it's not burnt, for example. This doesn't appear in anything to do with batteries, of course. So you would need to devise your own benchmarking assessment tool based on the standards that you want to see for electronic waste recycling. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I have been involved in electronic waste recycling in Central America and certain parts of Africa, but that's not my area of expertise. So as a battery, um, as an e-waste recycler, you, you would need to draw up your own um, VAT process for electronic waste and the, the questions would be different and the answers from A to D would be different because it's a different it's a different process it's a different uh, product it's a different outcome you know if uh, such a tool has been developed for other industries like the mobile telecoms or uh, computer industry I, I actually don't know Um, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting project idea for um, for Google or, or the sector to develop such a such a tool. I imagine it would be of um, you know uh, value to our members as they're thinking about recycling partners and uh, how to select select them. Um, I, th I think so I think that's right. Cer cer certainly, some of the sites I've seen where PVC is still being burnt, the the sites are horrendous, and the the atmosphere around them is 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 acrid. Because of the uh, the PVC and the um, and hydride hydrochloric acid being emitted during the burning operation, so you know that would be something for your members to put together uh, entirely, and it would be a very good project to do. How many of the um, of the tool that we looked at the This uh, BAT, what percentage of the indicators do you think? I'm losing you. 
actually. I'm only getting half the conversation, but I think you're asking me uh, what percentage would be applicable. Um, I I wouldn't like to guess, actually, um, because I'm not entirely familiar with all the aspects of, um, of electronic waste. You know, I, in electronic waste, you're not only going to get lead acid batteries, you're going to get lithium batteries. Um, and uh, the BAT does not apply to lithium batteries. Lithium batteries have different properties when they're used. You know, they have a propensity to uh, to catch fire. They have a propensity to do all sorts of other things that are completely different to use batteries. So you, you would need to sit down and um, and work out exactly what products you're dealing with, what the um, conditions are, whether they're hazardous or non-hazardous, uh, what is safe and what isn't safe, what's hygienic and what isn't hygienic. Um, it's a it's an entirely new process. You could not just take the BAT for battery recycling and put it in and make a few modifications. You, you need to sit down and give it some serious thought. Okay, understood. We are compiling a list of, of project ideas to, to take forward and that we have a new one for the list. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Great. And we, we have um, a couple of the companies on, on the line. I'm keen to give them an opportunity to, to ask questions. Sure. Um, uh, I don't know why I can't I see the questions, but I cannot see any of the questions at all. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I can't explain that, but if we don't have any uh, any further questions at the moment, but if um, if any come through, I will ask. Uh, uh, I wonder, Kenneth, um, do you have any from uh, Greenlight Planet, or you also have uh, El, Had El Hadji uh, from Ulu Solar in uh, in Senegal? I wonder if either of you have got a specific like uh, online, or even ask uh, Peter and um, Mobisol from their experience. Um, perhaps not. Um, maybe, uh, Brian. Uh, you know, you've got experience from uh, from Kenya. Uh, what other um, countries in Africa um, have you? Have you, have you visited and is there anything that you can say about the, the standards of um about the standards in, in recycling plants elsewhere yes interestingly you have a representative from senegal uh, senegal i've visited many times uh it's a lovely country i really do thoroughly enjoy working in senegal and i've worked closely with the government there and also with uh, gravitar and we've applied the bat process to the gravitar smelter um mm -hmm. And they not, have not only improved considerably, uh, but they've now been so successful in Senegal, they're actually moving to a larger plant and they're going to build a new recycling plant. And that will obviously be subject to licensing using the BAT tool. Um, I've also visited Tanzania and I've visited Kenya uh, as well. Right. And... Um, Ghana as well. We heard earlier, right? Um, and Ghana. Oh, sorry, and Ghana. Yes, there's four. There's four recycling plants in Ghana, and um, uh, they the tool has not only been used to assess the environmental performance of those plants by the government regulators, but as I said there, I was so pleased that in Kenya at the UNIA conference to to hear from the Ghanaian representative to say that the BAT now forms part of their uh, licensing process, so that they have to. They have to physically go and visit the plant, carry out an assessment before the license is actually issued to operate the plant. And that is that that makes sense because if the plant is not operating and they're applying for a license, you can't carry out a quantitative examination. You can only carry out a qualitative examination. So that's what they do. And then when the plant starts to operate, they then go and take the quantitative sampling. Uh, so it's, it's a very good scheme. I was really pleased with Ghana. Yeah. OK. Good to hear. Uh, Athena's hand is raised. Um, Athena Kiriakoplu has uh, joined us. Um, let me unmute you, Athena. And oops, yeah. It shows you're self muted. Um, I am self muted. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Drew. <laughs> um, my apologies. Uh, I just wanted to mention that there, um, I don't know, Brian, if you've heard of the WE LABEC standards as they no. relate to e waste uh, recyclers. Um, I think we can look into it, but uh, there's a potential there that the WeLabEx standards um, could cover the areas that the, the lead 
uh, BAT tool doesn't um, in terms of a similar assessment. Uh, but but that's something that could could potentially uh, work together um, to give solar manufacturers that capability of assessing their downstream partners. Very good. Thanks for that, Athena. Thank you. Um, I see we're, we're coming towards the end of the time and haven't had any more questions. Um, so in which case, um, I think we can, we can move towards uh, a wrap up. Um, Brian, maybe I'll give you a chance for any, any closing remarks or kind of final takeaways that you'd like to leave with, with the audience. Uh, no, I, I'm fine as long as everybody is happy. And uh, what I will try and do is I'll try and keep you up to date with any courses that we're running, providing they're within range. Uh, we ran a course uh, two weeks ago uh, in Fiji, um, and that's not easy to get to, I can assure you. But if it's uh, more local, then we'll, we'll keep it bear in mind. If you want to run a course, uh, you want us to run a course for you, um, then, you know, just let me know. We'll try and fit a date to do that. But we probably need to run it at your office uh, if, if that's possible. Or or depending where your clients are, your members are, we could run it overseas. But uh, to make it worthwhile, you'd need to get about 12 to 20 people there so that it really is a, a good uh, a good opportunity to teach as many people as possible. Yeah, I think that's a, an interesting opportunity. Uh, I dare say the, the majority of our uh, the, the densest concentration of our members is in the East Africa and perhaps Kenya. And we are looking at a, uh, an event uh, later this year for the working group. And I think that's one of the things that we can consider and, uh, and uh, assess demand, whether there's um, the kind of 12 to 24 people that would, uh, that would go for that. Um, we, well, we actually I, understand I'm going to, I'm going to say to you, if you do it in Kenya, I'm absolutely certain that ABM batteries would be more than happy to allow us after the training to go and carry out an assessment on their plant, um, which would be fantastic because as, as good as I think the virtual walkthrough of a plant, which I can do in a classroom on video, um, it's, it's always so much better for the delegates to actually visit a real plant and carry out a real assessment on a, on a plant that's actually in operation. Uh, there's, no, there's nothing better. Uh, and the experience makes them much more confident when they visit plants, say in Tanzania, when I'm not around. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can imagine that practical experience. Um, there's no substitute for it. Uh, yeah. Um, cool. Well, that, that's good to bear in mind as we as we think about and uh, plan that. We we have had now a question from Kenneth at Greenlight Planet, who's um, one of the, the market leaders in the, the industry. And Kenneth says um, they only have lithium batteries in this pro in in their products. Um, however, this session has been very educative. And he asks whether there is a, a tool for. And we, I wonder, uh, Athena, maybe you can say whether the the We Labex standards um, uh, covers lithium batteries as well. We Labex is for uh, e-waste dismantlers mostly, rather than the intricacies of um, lithium battery recycling. Um, so as far as e-waste dismantlers go, it, it goes to storage and transport of the lithium batteries to a different facility. Okay. Um, Drew, so can I Drew, Drew uh, it's Brian. <laughs> the, the, problem, yeah. the problem that we've got at the moment, and, and I'm not involved with lithium batteries, but I do get, I do have problems posed to me all the time about recycling lithium batteries. Unfortunately, lithium batteries at the moment are not recycled. Those that are trying to recycle them are finding that they can't recycle them economically. So as Athena says, they're either going into storage in the hope that at some point uh, they will be recycled economically or they're being disposed of. Um, and you've got to be very careful in the industry uh, at the moment because the lithium batteries are not being recycled the question is, is that a sustainable is that a sustainable future for uh, solar energy? Are you just going to keep using lithium, uh, primary lithium that you dig out of the ground to make batteries and then store the used ones? Um, or are you going to find a, a chemistry that can be recycled? Because otherwise we're going to build up a lithium battery mountain somewhere in the world or in many places in the world because they are currently not being recycled. My understanding is that 
Umicor in Belgium is one company that is recycling. Well, uh, you should the, talk. You yeah. Talk to Ra you should talk to Raphael, uh, who actually visited uh, Unicor in Belgium, and ask him exactly what he saw when he went to the plant, uh, and you'll be you'll be surprised. Okay, interesting um, discussion for for another day. Um, and yeah, I think we will um, now move to, to to wrap this up. So, uh, yeah, Brian, again, thank you very much for, for, for your time and sharing these insights. And um, you know, I think um, Google, certainly the Google e-waste uh, toolkit and hub is going to be richer from this. And um, you know, I'm, I'm very glad that our members have access uh, to this information and uh, are able to pursue that if um, if they if they wish. Um, I just want to get the slides up to, to wrap up. Mm -hmm. um, let me share screen. And Drew, you've got the uh, PDF version of the handouts so that everybody can have a copy of the slides. Yes, I do. Um, so they will they will be uh, shared uh, after this. Um, now I just want to close them um, by saying that the next steps for the toolkits. Um, we're now moving on to on to module two and we have the, uh, the seminar for that uh, this coming tuesday 11 30 till 1 uh, cest uh, we'll have a short presentation by uh, fairphone um, which is a fantastic company uh, doing good work on sustainability in the mobile industry and then a, a panel discussion with three uh, companies in the off-grid solar sector that's azuri SolarWorks and Strathmore. So that promises to be another uh, rich and interesting seminar. And I'd encourage everyone to get involved. Um, if you haven't already looked at the Gogla e-waste toolkit online, check it out, www.gogla.org forward slash e-waste. Um, but with that, I think that's um, everything. So yeah, thank you very much to everybody who's attended. I, I'm sure you also found it interesting. In and thank you very, very much to, to Brian um, for, for your time and sharing all of this uh, fantastic work. You're most welcome. And with that, excellent. Yeah, I will say uh, goodbye to everybody and uh, close the webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Lewis. Thanks, Brian.